Now that we know about rectangular and polar forms of complex numbers, one of the most important things to do is to work out in what circumstances you should use each particular form. Each one has its own unique strengths and advantages and this particular question tries to uh, sort of bring out some of the situations where you might want to use a polar form or where you might want to use rectangular form depending on what kinds of things you're doing with these complex numbers. So let's have a look at the question, try and unpack what's going on. They introduced to you uh, a couple of complex numbers on the plane. You've got Z1 over here, 1 plus 5i, and Z2, 3 plus 2i. And then they say, uh, let Z, this particular number which we're going to focus on throughout this question, let it be the quotient uh, of Z1 and Z2. What happens when you divide uh, this complex number by this one? Uh, and then there's a series of questions that follow from this. And you can see parts A, B, and C, as is often the case, um, are really all leading in one direction. So part C is kind of of the real question as it were and parts A and B are what us teachers like to call scaffolds. They're things that are going to uh, get us like stepping stones all the way towards C which is the final result. So let's have a go at trying to answer the question in the way that they've framed it and then we're also going to compare it with well what if we just got given the question um, without any guidance on a specific method, how would we solve it and can we confirm that we get the same answer either way. So first thing says find the modulus of z, that's, that's this quotient here, without finding z. Okay so you can see um, on both part a and b what they're trying to say is don't just divide through a, uh, sorry z1 divided by z2, see if you can work out the modulus and in a second the argument without actually evaluating the number itself. So how do we go about this? Well, what we need to remember, uh, and we developed this from polar form, right, is that when you are taking the modulus of something which is a quotient, um, what we do when we uh, multiply complex numbers is we multiply the moduli. Here, I'm, I'm not multiplying, I'm dividing. So we get to take the inverse of that. Instead of multiplying the moduli, we will divide the moduli. And you can see that in very simple algebraic terms. Because z is defined as z1 on z2, Therefore the modulus of z is just the modulus of that fraction and one of the things about the absolute value is that the absolute value of a quotient is the quotient of the absolute value. So I can actually just do these two separately like so. So how do I work out what each of these are? Remember, uh, we can think about this geometrically. We get this from Pythagoras' theorem. The modulus is the distance from the origin to said complex number. So really what we're using is uh, you know, the right angle triangle with our rectangular bits in there. Uh, in this case, one and five and then three and two. And when they're just, we're gonna feed them into Pythagoras' theorem. So just to remind you, right? The absolute value of uh, a plus ib for some arbitrary complex number is going to be the square root of a squared plus b squared, right? So uh, the modulus is like c, it's the hypotenuse, yeah? So let's go ahead and do that with these particular z1 and z2. On the numerator, I'm going to have the square root of, uh, what are my coefficients here, what are my a and b? They are, by the looks of it, I'll just highlight it up the top here. They're going to be 1 and 5, so I get 1 squared plus 5 squared underneath the square root. Uh, and then when I go on to the denominator, again, I'm going to get a square root. Uh, this time, you can see it up the top there, uh, my a and b will be 3 and 2, so I get 3 squared plus 2 squared. Okay, let's start to simplify this out. On the numerator, it looks like I'm getting the square root of 1 plus 25, so that's going to be the square root of 26. And then the denominator, I'm getting the square root of 9 plus 4, which is 13. So square root of 13, uh, coincidentally, not coincidentally, it's designed this way, square root of 26 um, divided by the square root of 13, that's a factor, so I just get the square root of 2 at the bottom. In case you're uncertain about that, uh, just like we were seeing with the absolute value, the quotient of square roots is the square root of the quotient. So that's kind of a handy thing to simplify. All right, so uh, I'm done, that's part A. I have found the modulus without finding where the actual number is and I've gotten that from, I should write part A, uh, I've gotten that from the fact that when you divide uh, two complex numbers, the modulus, you just divide the moduli. Okay, great. Part B, um, find this thing here and hence find argz without finding z. All right, so we need to take a bit of a run up to understand what this question is asking and why. I mean, we could just evaluate it as it is, but I think it's very important to know why have they handed us uh, this expression here? Like where, where did this come from, okay? 
So what we need to think about is, just like in part A, if you want to find the modulus of um, dividing two complex numbers, then we divide the moduli. Well, how do we do the same thing for the arguments? Well, when you multiply complex numbers, you add the arguments. There's that very handy alliteration that we've uh, seen before. Since we are not multiplying, we are dividing, instead of adding the arguments, we're going to subtract the arguments. And that's why you can see in here there's this minus sign, right? So let's try and unpack what's going on and put the working that will explain what's happening, right? Uh, with my complex numbers Z1 and Z2, it is important to know that they are both in the first quadrant. As a consequence of being in the first quadrant, we can actually use tan inverse to find out the arguments of each of those two complex numbers directly because they're in the first quadrant. So we don't need to worry about, oh, in the second and third quadrants, um, you know, tan inverse can't tell the difference between the second quadrant and the fourth quadrant. It also can't tell the difference between the first quadrant and the third quadrant because you end up with the same sign for tan. Uh, but because I already know from the outset that Z1 and Z2 are both in the first quadrant, and I'm gonna write this, um, I can therefore use tan inverse. So I'm gonna say since Z1 and Z2 are in the first quadrant, I can state what their arguments are directly from tan inverse. I can say, arg of z1 is going to be equal to tan inverse of, and from looking at this number, uh, it's going to be the y on the x. This is the opposite, and this is the adjacent. If you want to think about, you know, uh, if I had 1 plus 5i, where would that look like? Somewhere like that. So this is 1 plus 5i. So when I put in my uh, five there, that's the opposite side to the angle that I'm interested in. And uh, here is my one over here in my right angle triangle. So you can see if this is my theta, then um, tan inverse uh, of this angle will be five over one opposite on adjacent. Okay, so let's come back over here. So this is five over one, which of course I'll simplify in a second. And arg of z2 is going to be tan inverse of, what was it? Uh, it's gonna be two over three. Again, it's the y on the x. So I'm gonna write that like so. So because I've got this fact that uh, when I divide complex numbers, I am subtracting the arguments, I can say uh, that the argument of just plain old z is going to be um, the first argument take away the second argument like so. So hopefully you're starting to see, okay, well this here, I can substitute these pieces and it's starting to look a whole lot like what was presented to me in the question. So if I do this substitution, um, this of course was 10 inverse of five. Um, this was 10 inverse of two thirds. This is arg z, but they're not asking us to evaluate this. Um, I don't have uh, you know, some exact value to five and two thirds, That's, that doesn't sit in a nice neat triangle that I know. So what I'm gonna do is, as the question suggests, I'm gonna take tan of both sides. So I'm gonna go tan of arg z, and that means I'm gonna have tan of the entire thing on the right hand side. So I'm just gonna, whoopsie dozy, I'm just gonna grab that. And I'm taking the entire thing on the right hand side. Now, it is worth noting, you have to be quite cautious with taking uh, trigonometric functions of inverse trigonometric functions and vice versa. And that's because particularly with sine and cosine, sine inverse and cos inverse, they both have, um, we have to do funky things with them to make sure that the inverse functions are actually functions. That's something we deal with under that topic separately. With tan and tan inverse, we're fairly lucky in that um, the, the domain restrictions are a little bit different. So when I'm going to evaluate shortly tan of tan inverse of five, we are just going to get five. So that's something that we can do in this question because of the nature of tan and tan inverse, but do be careful. Um, trig and inverse trig uh, mixing together is a common place where people simplify without understanding the nuances. Anyway, we can address that later on. Now, as the question has said, we, we've just taken this run up to get to what the question is asking us. Find tan of tan inverse, etc., and hence find arg z. So in order to do this, in order to unpack what's going on, we need to recognize that this here is really a compound angle formula. Maybe it doesn't look like that. Remember, tan inverse of five is an angle. It's the argument to z1. And tan inverse of uh, two thirds is also an angle. It's the argument to z2. So really, this is actually, uh, I could write this as, uh, I'll do it in purple, tan of A minus B, where A and B, capital A and capital B, are the angles involved. 